So thanks for your invitation. Uh, one of the reasons that I accepted your invitation, actually, uh, it's, it's just between you and me, is you, I realized that I was here, I was here in, in your institute 30 years ago. <laughs> In 1982, uh, 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 something which is called Zen Physica, a DF. And I used to play a guitar, and I, uh, I was doing it with my friends. And I was playing a song, a very famous song from Queen called 39. And you can see on the bottom of my guitar was written Queen, because I was one of the big fans, and I was actually one of those who introduced Queen in Armenia in, back in the 1980s. So I was the one who was organizing discos and I was acting as a DJ at the university in Yerevan introducing Queen and my first performance with Queen was actually here in Fistech in 1982 at DF and it's just a pure coincidence because 20 years later I met a guitarist from Queen Brian May right then in, in Canary Islands in Tenerife and I became a supervisor of his PhD this is in astronomy because he's an astronomer and we became very good friends, but everything started here at Fistech, actually, <laughs> back in 1982. So uh, it, it's very interesting. <laughs> I, I just realized this couple of months ago that I have to do it right now because next year will be late. So, well, and, and I hope you will enjoy my talk. And I'll try to sell the idea of attracting you to, to Canary Islands as PhD students because we have a beautiful institute it's based on these two islands. In La Palma, we have a big observatory and also observatory in Tenerife with a big institute, about 400 staff working in, in Tenerife Institute of Astrophysics of Canary Islands. Very famous institute, very dynamic, very young, very active. It's one of the really the best institutes in the world. I can tell you, it's, I'm not selling my institute, but this is the truth. Because someone like me who traveled all over the world as a postdoc, I've been working in many countries, so I can perfectly compare uh, how it works in the States or in UK and so on. And I think this is one of the best places where you can actually continue your PhD studies. And if you need any information, please contact me. There is my email address. So this is the institute, uh, this is the observatory in La Palma. It's called Observatorio del Roque de los Muchachos. There are many telescopes up here. You can see the roads going up to the 2,600 meter summit. And there is a huge canyon, enormous canyon, called La Cartera, about 1,500 meters going down. And there is a river and waterfall. And it's a very beautiful island, La Palma. Only 50,000 population, slightly more. This is the largest optical telescope in the world, based in La Palma. Canary Islands is called GTC, Gran Telescopio Canarias. It was commissioned a couple of years ago. This is a telescope Galileo, 3.5 meter, and a MAGIC Cosmic Ray Telescope, one of the most precise telescopes. There are two now doing interferometry. And a um, robotic, couple of robotic telescopes like this one, Mercator Swiss Belgian Telescope. William Herschel, 4.2 meter, very famous. This is perhaps the most reliable and solid telescope in the world. This telescope never breaks. It was made by British and Dutch. It's mostly British telescope, but it never fails. The whole mechanics and also it's a really brilliant telescope. It was made in back in the 80s and it's really in a very good shape. So this is the observatory in La Palma. There's pictures I took from the helicopter flying with Brian all over the <laughs> observatory taking pictures. It really is an amazing place to, to, to be. And um, this is the giant telescope, the GTC, and this is the next observatory on, right on Tenerife, the next island. The institute is based on this island. You can see there are plenty of small telescopes. It's mostly a solar observatory with um, doing some research on stars and planets and so on. But the giant telescope, the big ones are on La Palma Island. And this is the observatory on Teidem. So you are welcome. You can <laughs> visit my observatory. But the topic of my uh, talk is uh, exoplanets. Now, you, you perfectly know. Probably we can turn off these lights. Yeah, because it's, I think if I can. 
very good. So planets have been known for millennia. And actually, the first planets, Venus, Jupiter, Saturn, have been known as wanderers. From the Greek word, the planet means wanderer. Now, later, from 1781, uh, 1846, 1930, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto has been discovered. And we have been always asking ourselves whether there are more planets in the universe. And the most amazing statement, the very clear, very precise scientific uh, statement was done by Epicurus, a Greek philosopher, who already in 300 years before Christ made this very powerful statement. He said, there are infinite worlds, both like and unlike this world of ours, and we must believe that in all worlds, there are living creatures and planets and other things we see in this world. This is very strong and scientifically correct statement done 300 years before Christ. And then we had to wait another 1800 years until Giordano Bruno made a similar statement. Again, very strong, again, correct. But it was basically copying the statement of Epicurus, And he said, there are countless suns and countless earths all rotating around their suns in exactly the same way as the seven planets of our system. The countless world in the universe are no worse and no less inhabited than our Earth. Very strong, very clear. And then we had to wait another 500 years until the first extrasolar planet has been discovered. And this discovery was done by Michel Mayor and Didier Kelo, Swiss astronomers, my colleagues. We've been working for more than 10 years on, on, on this business. And uh, they used a small telescope in France, in Haute Provence, to prove the existence of a planet around 51 Pegasi solar type star. This star is like our sun, and it's just placed on 48 light years from the Earth. There are many different methods to de detect extrasolar planets. The first direct detection of an extrasolar planet was done by Spitzer satellite who captured the light from two known planets orbiting stars other than our sun. It was really the direct measurement of the emission from planets. So Spitzer did this job uh, eight years ago, about. Now, there are four basic methods to detect extrasolar planets. One is a Doppler method, detecting the star wobbling in the line of sight due to the planet's gravitational pull, astrometry, detecting tiny wobble of stars against other stars in the background, planet transit, detecting a tiny drop in brightness of the star as a planet passes in front, and uh, chronography, when you block the light of the star, the stellar limb, and in the background, you try to capture the planets. And I can show you one by one which is which. So this is a wobbling of, of planets. So you measure the, the motion of the star against the background stars. And this motion is due to the, is caused by the rotating, revolving planets. It's a very small motion, so you have to be super, super precise to see this, okay? So this is all technology-driven work. Actually, there's something I have to tell you. 80% of astronomy, of today's astronomy, is technology-driven. So it's only high-tech what is driving most of the astrophysical research. So we get better detectors, CCD detectors, better interferometers, better optics and laser guiding systems and even computer power and everything. So all this stuff in against, uh, okay, so we also put our telescopes in, on orbit. So all this together is driving astronomy. It's very strong. So this relation between technologies and astronomy is better than maybe in any other field. And that's why astronomy is becoming very expensive science very, very expensive. So it takes hundreds of millions to, to put a big project uh, in, in astronomy. But this is the price you have to pay to detect planets and if you want to go further to look for the life and so on. So this is an expensive science. It's not like in old days putting a telescope and looking at this. This doesn't exist today. So you, you go to X-rays and gamma ray satellites and all combined and is, is, is big, it's very big. It's, it's a part of globalization process on the planet. Astronomy is really taking part in this. And uh, 
and the Doppler shift to measure the tug of planets uh, on stars. And uh, the way it works is simple. You know very well that uh, spectral noise that are formed in the stellar atmosphere, they move because of the Doppler effect once the star is doing rotational motion. And we can detect this motion of absorption lines in the spectrum of the star caused by the gravity of the planet. And the um, method of transit is simple, that when a planet is passing by a star, we can detect a slight decrease in the amount of light from the star. So this can be 0.001% of the total light of a star. So you just need to have a very precise photometry and someone to detect it. We couldn't imagine that we can do this kind of things 20 years ago. But today, we can do very amazingly high precision photometry because of many reasons, because of uh, softwares also. You need very good software to do this kind of thing, noise cancelling stuff, better detectors. And obviously, you don't do it from a single passage. So you combine the light curve from thousands of uh, 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 transits. When you combine them, your signal to noise is rising up and then you can have this detection at, at, at very amazing levels. And obviously, the, you can also have an estimate of the size of a planet, which is blocking the line of the, of, the, of the star. So you can estimate the size and obviously the period, rotational period. And this method only works for those systems which are age on. So you can see that. So those systems which we see like that, obviously you cannot use the transit method. And now <coughs> there were two big missions, space missions, to, to detect uh, planets using this method, the transit method. One was Korot, launched in 2007, which was surveying 60,000 stars with a field three square degrees and precision 10 to minus four magnitude. And the Kepler mission, which is still active, it's still going on, is surveying 100,000 stars with a field of view 10 to, um, uh, 100 degrees, basically, precision with 5 times 10 to minus 5 magnitude. That's really very high precision. So we can really detect Earth-like planets with, with Kepler. And finally, coronagraphy is also a very active field of research. And we use big telescopes, Keck telescopes 9 meter in Hawaii, or the ones at VLT in Chile to do uh, uh, interferometry and also coronagraphy block the star and to do a deep, very deep imaging of the surrounding space. So you can close the star and take very deep images, uh, dozens and hundreds of images and combine them until you see whatever is placed here. And obviously you have to separate all these points because most of them are stars. So, so finally you can, after many, many integrations, you can catch the planet. And usually these are giant planets, and you see them in infrared light, not in optica. They are in infrared, and planets with masses three, four, five times the Jupiter mass. So they are giant planets, and they are very strong in infrared emission. But we mostly use the spectroscopy, the Doppler shifts in spectral lines, to detect planets and estimate their masses. This is a very nice example comparing Sun with Vega. If you increase the effective temperature only twice, and you see the huge difference in the spectrum. So you, you, have, uh, you have about 24,000 spectral lines in optical spectrum of the sun. And about 15% of these spectral lines are not identified. So they may belong to heavy elements, unknown elements, no one knows. And, and it's really tough to identify the spectral lines because it's, it's uh, in a cross section of laboratory physics, precise GF uh, oscillator strengths of transitions and, uh, and the high precision spectroscopy. In fact, the, the, the solar spectrum that we are studying has a signal to noise ra a ratio of 10,000 or 20,000. It's very high quality spectra and very high res a resol a resolution or resolving power, which is about 500,000. You can separate 0 0.001 angstrom spectral lines in that spectrum, okay? So the precision is very high. But we are very close to obtaining similar quality spectra for other stars, and we get them. So if you go to VLT in the ESO, and the spectrograph, which is called UVES, 
you can get uh, slightly similar quality spectra for other solar type stars. And you can do very precise, very precise. It's like a Juvelier work. You know, when you make uh, uh, rings and like the Juvelier's work, we work like that with this kind of spectra. It's very, you can see the shapes of spectral line profiles can tell you about very tiny physical processes in the atmospheres of stars. Amazingly small, weak processes which take place in stellar atmospheres. We can really see the star with this kind of spectra. It's, it's just amazing. Uh, it's, it's so different if you see a high quality data and a poor quality data, you see the difference. And you see the difference in physics, basically. You see what is happening there and what is happening there. It's, and we need precision because if we want to detect Jupiters or Earths around other stars, so for Jupiter, like we need a precision in Doppler velocities at 28.4 meters per second if the Jupiter is at one astronomical unit. And obviously, if it goes further at five astronomical units, we need 12.7 meters per second uh, precision. And to detect Earth, we need nine centimeters per second precision. But uh, probably we can do it very soon. This is the plot of a radio velocity, of a radio velocity against time. Now, how we measure radio velocity of spectral lines of, the given, of a given star? Now, look at the spectrum of the sun. What we do, uh, there are 24,000 lines, but if we take a standard classical spectrum of any star, there are five, 6,000 spectrum lines that we can use. Not 24, but five, 6,000. We do cross-correlation of all the shifts of spectral lines, the Doppler shifts, and we increase the precision. So imagine that all the spectral lines are shifted. So we, from one single line, we can have a precision like this, and from 5,000 lines, we have precision much more, of course, with the cross-correlation. So we use this method for, for, identify, for increasing the precision of Doppler line measurements in solar type stars. But we have to be very careful because we can only use old stars, stars which are older than one giga year. The young stars have activity, they have spots, they have big spots, and these spots change the profiles of spectral lines. They make our life very difficult. They have pulsations. Obviously, there are pulsations in solar type stars, but I will talk about this later, how, how we can eliminate them. But the young stars are very complicated for this kind of research. So we focus all our surveys to only, to, only to old stars, stars which are older than one giga year. And now during one night, let's say you go to the telescope and you have a task to detect a planet. What do you do? You take the spectrum. Every 15 minutes, we take one more spectra of the same star. Every 15 minutes, we take spectra and hundreds of spectra. We collect them. And each spectrum will give me one dot here. You can see one, one, one. So these are hundreds of observations of one single star. And this is the mean radio velocity shift of 5,000 spectral lines. OK? This is the mean shift. One measurement is from 5,000 spectral lines. And we make this plot. If I zoom here, this is what I see. OK? This is from 26 hours to 27 hours. So this is about half an hour, 30 minute episode. OK? So you can see this, uh, the, the change in, in radio velocity. And this is where you see actually. The, the planets revolving around stars. And this is what my colleagues, Mayor and Kellos, obtained in 95. This was the radio velocity curve around 51 Pegasi. The planet which had a half a Jupiter mass with a period of 4.2 days. So it was very close to the star. It was a giant planet like a Jupiter revolving very close to the star that nothing like that happens in the solar system. We have the Jupiter, five astronomical units, and here we see a Jupiter which is 100 times closer to the parent star than the Jupiter in our system. This is 0 0.05 astronomical units, okay? So once these people discovered the, 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 the planet around 51 peg, was a big boom in astronomy 
First of all, because it was the first planet, but the second, because it was killing all theories of planet formation. It was impossible to predict a giant planet formed such a close to the star. You cannot do it because you will immediately you will evaporate a planet. You are very close to the star and it's a gas planet. It's not a rocky planet. It's a gas giant planet like Jupiter. So the question was, and immediately people who are doing the theory started to speculate, okay, you formed a planet very far and it will migrate slowly. There is a process of migration coming close to the star, but for some reason, some physics will stop it at some distance, okay? So then we went to look for physics that can stop the planet from falling onto the star because the question was, if it's formed at five astronomical units or 10, why it has stopped at 0 0.05 astronomical, why did it didn't fall to the star? And it turned out, it turned out that models predicted that indeed simulations were showing that when you form a few big giant planets in the system, when the system is young, the formation time of a Jupiter-like planet is about two, three, five million years. So in two, three, five million years, you form a Jupiter. And then it takes another few million years to migrate this planet close to the star. But if you form a few big planets simultaneously in the system, then there is a billiard interaction between them. And some of these planets are kicked out from the system. They go to interstellar medium. They leave the system. And they become a free floating planets, planets without stars. Because we know that they exist. And we know that there are plenty. We also know that. We don't have any clear estimate because this is very hard to get them in interstellar medium. It's really hard because they are seen in infrared and they have to be close, they have to be big to see them. So with 10 meter class telescopes, we cannot do it. We need much bigger telescopes. And we need space missions in infrared, better detectors and so on in the future to get all these free floating planets without stars. But then, and then the simulations also show that some of these planets go to the star. They get to the star and they are absorbed by a star. And maybe one or two planets will survive in the system. It's very hard for big planets to live together in the system because they are too big. So they occupy a space, they fight, they fight in the system. And this is the reason it turned out that the big giant planets are actually rare. It's not very common to find the giant planets. In, in, in around stars. And so we initiated this HARPS co uh, project to look for uh, planets, not only giant planets, but also Neptunes. So the precision was much better than, than in 95. And these were the, actually the first systems which we're discovering. This is called H2-82943. These are two planet systems. Both planets are in resonant orbits. And they have very high eccentricity, 0.45 and 0.54. This is the radio velocity curve. So you can imagine that if there is only one planet, you see a sine curve. But if there are two planets, you see a complicated curve. Then you have to separate them. You have to separate the orbital parameters doing some simulations, etc. Now, the, the, the point is about this high eccentricity was so hot that we, we could even discover another system, which was HD 8606, a planet with an eccentricity 0.93. It's a giant planet, and the age of the system is about four giga years, so it's like the sun. And the question which was driving crazy our theoreticians is that how is it possible that the orbit is not circulized after a few tens of million years? Because you cannot have a dynamical system with five giga years old and with such a high eccentricity, something you have to dump up because of tidal forces, because of tidal interaction between planets, you have to dump the, 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 the eccentricity of the, of the planet. But the system is old and it has uh, 0.93 uh, eccentricity and the period 112 days. It's a very crazy system. This is the record now in, in extrasolar planets. It's breaking all records. and. The, and the planet has a mass four times Jupiter. It's a four Jupiter mass planet. And the point is when, it, when this planet is, is approaching the parent star so close with four Jupiter masses, it is supposed that the planet should trigger some very strong tidal interaction with the star. 
and maybe even create some activity, chromospheric activity or whatever. We have been trying to capture this with spectroscopy, but we never could do it. And the reason, because of these peaks, you can see the peak means the high eccentricity. So it's very hard to capture the planet when it is rotating around the star because this is so fast. The process is so fast that you cannot get it right here. But the, the problem for theoreticians was to find some physics, some mechanism which can pump the eccentricities of, of planets. You need a mechanism, you need a physical mechanism which can drive the eccentricity to these values and stabilize it. That's another question. Now you can maybe pump up the eccentricity to these values, but how you stabilize it? Because it should go on like hundreds of million years. If we are seeing these systems, it's not just by coincidence that because we captured the system and after 1,000 years the eccentricity will go down. No, no, no. It's a pure statistics. You can do that. The fact that we get all these systems, it means that they are real and their time is really, is really long. The, the survival time of this planet must be very long. It cannot be a pure coincidence that we capture the system like this. It means there are mechanisms, physical mechanisms, which can pump the eccentricity and keep it like this. Keep it like 0.91. So this is very interesting. So all what I'm saying is really a top research that is done today. It's not something which has been done and we know the answer, no. We don't know the answers because every time we are discovering new systems and every time the new system brings new problems, new problems. So what we understand is the solar system is not really a prototype of planetary systems. There is a huge, huge diversity of planetary systems that you can find around, around other stars. This is another system called New Ara with four planets. And that's why you see this complex radio velocity curve. And you can see that the, the, the minima are going down. This is because there is another planet with a very long period. So these curves are overlaid on this long period and you may catch it after five years or 10 years because the period of that planet is very long. It's maybe a giant planet, okay? And then you separate a couple of, and sometimes we combine the data from different spectrographs, like this is Harps, Coralie, and Nucleus. These two are in, in, in Chile, and this one is in Australia. And, and another system which has five Earth masses in habitable zone, something which we call habitable zone around stars is a zone where you expect a liquid water to exist on the surface. So it's an ideal distance from the star where the temperature, the surface temperature of a planet is such that you can expect a, a liquid water, if there is, if there is. Okay? And another system with three Neptunes discovered by Harbour. So there's a huge variety of different systems. And something that you have to be very careful when you do radio velocities like this, you have to almost always do a simultaneous uh, photometry or a study of light, integrated light from a star, because sometimes there are, can be spots on the surface that can mimic a planet, the surface spots on the sun or, or the, on the star that can look like you are observing a planet, but if you do photometry, you will find a, a change in the light with the same period, which means that this change is not caused by a planet. It can be caused by pulsations, it can be caused by spots, but anything but not a planet. And um, you have to perfectly separate all physical processes in the stellar uh, atmosphere, like granulation, uh, which has a, 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 a period, a quasi period of six minutes, mesogranulation, about three hours, supergranulation, one day. So there are different physical mechanisms connected with the turbulence and the macro turbulence and so on. The stellar atmospheres are complex when you get to this level of precision. If you don't have precision, everything is simple. The spectra are simple, everything is nice, everything is static, everything is perfect. When you go to your high precision work, you start to see many tiny physical processes in the atmospheres. Non-radial pulsations, waves on the surface, some flares, activity, you see even flares, localized flares from your spectra, motion of Doppler in the spectra. So this is amazing what you see when you go to high resolution and high precision work. 
Now, this is the overview of the whole thing that we see in extrasolar planet stuff. About 865 exoplanets have been found so far. And most of these planets have been found using this radio velocity Doppler technique. At least 60% of sun-like stars have planetary systems. But I would say it's not 16, it's probably 80 or maybe even 90% of stars, solar type stars have planets. We know this already. And it's a, it's a very solid observational fact. And there are about 134 multi-planet systems, about 230 planets transiting their host stars. We have discovered 87 Neptunes and super Earths. Super Earth is a planet with mass at least five and 10 times the Earth mass. It's a rocky planet. It's not a gas planet, it's a rocky planet. That's why we call it super Earth. The radia are not so different from the Earth, maybe two, three times the Earth radius, but the, the, the masses are very high. Then we have 13 planets detected by direct imaging, so which means we see these planets in, on the CCD in images. And we have eight planets with molecules detected. So we can detect the molecules in the atmospheres of planets. But it's uh, very difficult, and we do it only in eight cases. We did it only in eight cases. Those cases, some of those cases are direct spectroscopy of planets which are massive, and we see them in infrared. So we go to infrared, and we take spectra, and then we see molecular lines in the atmospheres of those planets. It has been done by Spitzer, by Hubble. We see, hyd uh, we see water, we, we see methane, we see the carbon dioxide. And there are also cases of 13 free-floating planets, so the planets which are not connected to, to other stars. This is a mass distribution of extrasolar planets. So you can see that there are two peaks. The black histogram is the distribution just taken from the data. And the red one is the black distribution but corrected for observational bias. Because when you do observations, you are biased, which means you always don't take into account some effects like your precision, the timing that you are observing planets, and so on. You have to correct always for those effects. And if you correct for them, you, this is the distribution you get, which means that most of the planets that are formed around stars have masses of a Jupiter, or very close. So this is the, the peak is at the Jupiter mass. And also about 15 Earth masses, which is a mass of the Neptune. So again, there are two peaks. The first one is at the Jupiter, and the second one is at the Neptune. Most of the planets that we detected today have mean masses around uh, Jupiter. And of course, we also see many planets three, four times Jupiter mass, but the statistics are telling us that uh, one Jupiter is the most probable mass. And this is what you see, expect from simulations, from models. So models tell you exactly this, that you get one Jupiter mass peak, you get a peak at Neptune, but models also tell you that you have a huge peak at Earth masses. So this is where you expect most of the planets in the universe should have one Earth mass. So the Earth must be the most common planets in the universe. And this is coming really from simulations. Observationally, we cannot get this because we don't have a precision. We have to wait five years or 10 years. We are building better spectrographs and so on. So we will get there in five or 10 years time. I mean, to do statistics. Maybe we can get the first detection of the Earth around the solar type star after five years. We are actually detecting Earth mass planets around low mass stars, K type stars. There have been some detections reported in the, in the press and the literature. But these are detections around low mass stars, not the stars like our sun. To detect the Earth at the distance of the Earth around the star like a sun, we don't have a precision today. So we have to wait about five years or maybe less, maybe more, we will see. But then we will detect Earth-like planets. And, and the time that we will have for statistics of detecting hundreds of planets like this, so probably we have to wait uh, a few years, just a few years. And, and the period distribution of, of extrasolar planets is also something very interesting. There was a cutoff at three days. 
So for some reasons, all the planets, extrasolar planets, the shortest period we see was three days. There are no planets with a period two days or something. So again, because there is some physics which stops the planets falling uh, to the star at, at a given distance. They are parked uh, close to the star. And uh, an interesting relationship between mass and uh, period. You see that all this area is almost empty. These are short periods and high masses. So we don't have planets with masses six times Jupiter and so on at orbits less than 100 days. Okay, so the very big, very big planets are not close to the stars. So the case that we, uh, Mayor and Kellos discovered in 95 was 0.5, the 51 Pegasi is here. So it's again, it's a giant planet, but it's not a very big giant. It's not larger than Jupiter. Okay, it was 0 0.5 Jupiter mass, and it had a period of um, four days, which is here, right? But if we increase the mass of the planet, so like plan all the planets that are here, a few times Jupiter mass, then we do not find any with a short period, okay? And now it's interesting to compare eccentricity distribution of binary stars, binary systems, and planetary systems. Because if you assume that they have the same physics of formation from condensation of gas, then you would expect to have the same distribution of orbital parameters, stars and planetary systems, okay? Now, if we compare eccentricity distributions, the, the black points are planetary systems and the empty pentagons are stars, binary stars. So we don't find any big difference in eccentricity distribution. But we do see something very interesting that the planets with masses, Earth masses less than 100, which is this, do not have high eccentricity. So for some reason, there is again some physics, some processes which push the big planets, the ones that are here, the Jupiters, few Jupiters, at very high eccentricities. But we don't find these big eccentricities for small mass planets, which are in the near orbits. So there are some processes which control all these a game of distribution of orbital parameters. Uh, okay. Mm, the other thing that I want to draw your attention is the frequency uh, of uh, giant planets with the metal content of the star. It was a very important discovery that we did back in 2001 that the, the, the giant planets like Jupiter are formed more frequently around stars that have high metallicity, high content of metals two times more than the sun. So the maximum metallicity that we see in the galaxy, in our galaxy, in a logarithmic scale is about 0.5, which means about three times more than the sun. But this is coming from the enrichment of interstellar medium, from producing all these heavy elements with supernovae and enriching them. So the present day, today, in a galaxy, the maximum metallicity you have is 0.5, three times more than the sun. Maybe after 50 billion years, we will have metallicity one. So because there will be more and more heavy elements. So are always burning hydrogen and helium, converting them into heavy elements. This process has been going on for 15, well, 13 billion years, 13 billion years. And, and in 13 billion years, we reached the metallicity 0.4, let's say, which is today. And because of that, all the giant planets are formed around stars which have lots of metals. So if we go to population three stars, which are very metal poor stars, the oldest stars in our galaxy that are 10, 13 billion years old, have metallicity 10,000 times, 1,000 times less than the sun. If you look at the spectra of these stars, they are like the solar type stars. You don't see any spectral lines. It's amazing. I showed you the spectrum of the sun in the beginning. And if I show you a similar star like the sun, you will see no lines. There are no spectral lines. There are no metals. It's just amazing how clean is the spectrum. You only see hydrogen and not even helium because the temperature is not hot enough. So you see only hydrogen. And because these stars do not have metals, they are the oldest stars in our galaxy. 
And uh, if I count the number, maybe we have only 30, 40 stars like that. It's very hard to find these stars, the oldest stars in the galaxy. And some of them show few elements, and those few elements are coming from the first generation of supernovae, the first supernovae in our galaxy. So by calculating abundances and studying these stars, we can tell about the first generation of supernovae in the galaxy. It's a very interesting observational work, but nevertheless, the, the, the fact that the metallicity of the star is correlating with, uh, with the number of Jupiters means that there were no Jupiter-like planets in the early galaxy. So the stars which are very metal poor do not have Jupiter-like planets. So the formation of planets is a function of time in the galaxy. More metal reach the galaxy, more processed is the matter in the interstellar medium, more frequently you form giant planets. It's a very tight correlation between these, so which you can predict that the number of forming planets in the galaxy is going to up. So we form more and more planets now because there are more metals. And we need metals to form Jupiter-like planets because metals provide um, necessary ingredients for dust particles. And the core of a planet is nothing else than a dust, basically, it's a stardust. It's a solid, these are solid elements. You glue them up, you glue them, and you form a core. The core which has ma about 10 times the mass of the Earth. And then you accrete a gas then you create a gas and you form a Jupiter-like planet. So the standard theory in models, if you run a model, if you have a protoplanetary disk with gas and dust, 10 times more gas than the dust by mass. This is the standard, uh, what we expect in the, in the interstellar medium. So in this system, after some time, simulations show that you start forming by collision of small dust particles, you form small cores and small solids, and then they collide more and more, and they start forming the first cores of giant planets with 10 Earth masses, and they accrete a gas. And after some time, there is no gas left in the disk. So the whole gas is eaten, is absorbed by giant planets. They take the whole gas. But you are still left with small stones, like small, we call them planetesimals, or asteroids, or whatever you want to call them. But these are rocky bodies. And these rocky stones will stay in the system for billions of years, like we have in our solar system. We don't have gas, but we have lots of stones, lots of rocky matter, right? So the same thing is happening in all these planetary systems. But the point is, to form a rocky planet, you don't need metallicity. You don't need high number of metals. So probably the simulations telling us that you can form two, three Earth mass planets, rocky planets, in any system, you don't need gas for this. So just the rocks can form it. So you may have lots of stars which have only rocky planets, planets like the Earth. But to have a Jupiter, you need a high metallicity. Because for Jupiter, you need a big core, 10 Earth masses core to create a gas. And for this, you need lots of metals. So this is the current knowledge, which is really supported by observations. And maybe the proof is that if we compute the metallicity of the stars with planets, we see that for Neptunes, the distribution is flat. The planets, this is for Neptunes, and the black histogram is for Jupiters. We see the center is high metallic. This is a logarithmic scale. It's iron over hydrogen. So the sun is at zero. And these are the most metal-rich stars in the galaxy. And we see that this distribution is actually telling us that 30% or 40% of metal-rich stars have Jupiter-like planets. So this is pure statistics coming from, from this data. And um, uh, I, I do not want to stop you on, on this uh, stuff, but something I should tell you about lithium you might have heard about uh, lithium is a, is a very fragile chemical element which is destroyed in stellar atmospheres when you have mixing. So why are we interested in this element? The nuclei of lithium-7 are destroyed at 2.5. If the temperature is more than 2.5 million degrees, you destroy lithium-7 nuclei. If the temperature is more than 2 million degrees, you destroy lithium-6 isotope. If the temperature is more than 3 million, you destroy beryllium. And if it's more than 3.5, you destroy boron. 
So these four chemical elements are like a sequence of, uh, of, um, of observational tests for low mass stars. Why? Because uh, I can give you some example how we use this diagnostic in, in stellar atmospheres. Now imagine the sun. The sun uh, forms from the accretion of gas and it takes about 30 million years for the sun to burn, to start burning hydrogen. So which we call a pre-main sequence phase of the sun. So once it starts the contraction, the temperature in the center is going up, the star is fully convective. First it will start burning the ethereum, which is very easy to burn. The ethereum is the first element which you burn. And then the second thing which you start burning is lithium, because for lithium you need only two point lithium-6, you need to only 2 million degrees. And then after that, you start burning lithium-7 because the temperature in the core is going up. And once it sees going up, you're starting to burn one element after another until you will reach about 10 million degrees and you start the fusion of hydrogen. And then you stay on the main sequence as a star for 10 billion years because you have enough energy, enough fuel to burn for 10 billion years. So the whole hydrogen is enough for you, more than enough to burn 10 billion years. But before that, you start burning very light elements like deuterium, lithium, and so on. Now, the whole trick about the solar type stars is this. Once the sun will reach the main sequence because of its mass and because of its temperature, it will burn only part of the lithium. Some lithium will stay in the atmosphere. The mass of the sun is, is such that it cannot burn the whole lithium, so something will stay from the lithium-7 in the atmosphere. And we see that, solar type stars, young stars with some lithium-7. But it may burn, the, it should burn the whole lithium-6 because lithium-6 is very easy to burn. And observations show that there is no star with the mass of the sun that has a lithium-6, but all of them have lithium-7. So we had an idea that if a star like the sun will absorb a planet, at some stage, after 15, 100 million years because of some processes, the planets have lithium-6. And this lithium-6 will stay in the atmosphere of the star, and we can see it. And it can be a signature if that, that was an accretion of a planet. And actually, we discovered two, three cases of stars like the sun, which had this lithium-6 isotope, which was a very clear signal that there was a planet engulfed by a star. So this is a test that we have been using for uh, in, in, in our work. That's an, um, how much time I have? Ten. How much? Half an hour. Skolka? You should put it up, okay. <laughs> but it should be 45 minutes, right, in total? Not one hour. I thought. Okay, right, okay. Right, so I, uh, okay. And now the trick is, if I go to places like open clusters, open clusters are places where you have a formation of stars, clusters, stellar clusters, you form stars, okay? One of the clusters, which is very rare, it's called M67, and it's very famous open cluster, very famous. So in this cluster, we see a huge scatter in abundance of lithium at solar temperatures. So for some reason, all these stars have the same age and the same metal content and the same structure. Everything is the same for these stars. The only difference is a huge abundance, more than 10 times of lithium in their atmospheres. So all the chemical elements are the same. If you study the spectra of all these stars, you will find they are identical. All chemical elements are exactly the same. But these stars do not have lithium, and these ones have a lot of lithium. So you immediately ask a question, why? What is the reason the two identical stars, everything is the same, one has 10 times more lithium than the other one? And the answer to this is you have to go back to the history of these stars. Because apparently some of these stars started the evolution with fast rotation and the others were slow. And the reason of this fast and slow rotation can be the presence of planets. When you form a planetary system, 
the planets take 90% of angular momentum in the disk. So most of the angular momentum is locked in planets, like in the solar system. If you take the solar system, the planets take more than 90% of angular momentum. Very little is left to the sun. The sun doesn't have momentum. It's in planets. The same will happen in all the systems that take few Jupiter masses, a distance five astronomical units is a huge momentum. Now, if, if Jupiter somehow will collide with the sun, it will transfer enormous amount of angular momentum to the sun. The sun should start rotating very fast because the momentum of Jupiter is huge, okay? Now, the rotation is only process that can change the abundance of this chemical element, lithium. Because of the rotation, you start initiate very mixing of the upper atmosphere with the core of the star. So the reason that we go to lithium is because we want to understand whether these stars were fast or slow rotators four billion years ago. Because this cluster is very old. It has an age of the sun. This cluster is about four billion years old. It's like the sun. And all these stars, since they are in the same cluster, they have the same age. They have the same metal content, composition, everything. So it's a very homogeneous place to look for these kind of games between lithium and rotation and so on. And, uh, and that's why when we see this big difference in lithium abundances, we think that in open clusters, some of these stars may have planets, others may not. But the, these stars are very far, so there is no way we can go with our spectrographs and look for planets here. So we need big telescopes to look for planets in these systems, okay? So we have been trying, but it's impossible. So for stellar clusters, we have to wait a few years then. And uh, the, 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 uh, the lithium problem in, in these systems was very active until 2009 when we made a very clear comparison of stars with and without giant planets and we plotted lithium abundance against effective temperature of stars. You see the sun is here with a temperature of 5,777 Kelvin, plus minus 70 degrees from the sun. So all these stars are like our sun. They're solar analogs. We call them solar analogs, okay? They have a very similar structure. They are all on the main sequence. They are not evolved and so on. But for some reason, we see that all the stars above this line that do not have planets have high lithium. And all the other stars that have planets have low depleted lithium. So which means that we, from observations, we see a very clear link between rotational history of the star and the presence of planets through the spectral line of lithium. So this is amazing. I'm always telling that only in astronomy, it's only, especially in these fields, you can feel so close what is happening in nature and what you are actually doing. So this, this distance between resolving something, which is a mystery, and doing something is, is basically, there is no distance. Every time you do new observations, you discover something else. Every time you go to telescope with clearly knowing what you are doing, you discover something else. Sometimes we write papers in the telescope because we see something immediately and we start writing a paper. So this, uh, this, uh, the, the passion in, 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 in high, at least in high resolution astrophysics, in, in observational astrophysics with, in the field of extrasolar planets is enormous, is impressive, is incredible. There is no other field I know that you can be so excited about what you are doing because this is really, you feel it, you see it. You see it, and there, is, there are no people who are, let's say, controlling the field. They are Nobel Prizes, and they are telling, no, this, is, this has to be, no, it doesn't exist in this field. This is the field where you go, you do, and you see what you are doing, and you get there, and you know that you are on the front. And you do something, and you send the paper to nature, because this is a discovery, and it's gone to the refereeing process. And if you have something strong, it's impossible that someone can stop your work. It's really impossible. So, uh, and I've heard from one of the editors of Nature, because he was talking with some other editors of different branches in physics, and they were all saying that the most exciting and clear and fair field probably in branches of physics is astrophysics. It's really like that. It's very fair. It's, uh, 
It's at the level of PhD students. Can the PhD students can come up with the discovery, and it's happening very often. When you do some research, you know, and then you have something very strong, because the topic is very young, and there are so many things to do. The number of astronomers working in this field has increased 100 times in the last 10 years. But the field is not saturated, because there are so many things to do that there is no any, any crossing in different projects. So this is the nice thing about this topic of extrasolar research. This is another example I want to tell you. We, we knew for many years that going to massive stars, more massive than the sun, the sun is here, OK? 5,700 Kelvin. This is lithium again against effective temperature. And the sun is here. So we knew that if we go to hotter stars, the abundance of lithium is increasing because the convective layers are shallow and the lithium is not destroyed. It doesn't go to the center and the lithium remains in the atmosphere. And we see this high abundance of lithium. But last year, we discovered all these stars here. So theoretically, this star should not exist. There is no theory, no model that can explain the presence of these stars in astrophysics. It's impossible. So, and this is new. Now we have a task, now we are just starting a project to look at each, each of these stars very carefully and try to understand why these stars do not have lithium, which is not, which is just impossible according to any, any, any models in astronomy. The, the strong depletion of lithium. And <coughs> Finally, there is something important I want to, and this is another example I want to tell you. Uh, I was telling you about Juvelier work in astronomy. You can see this is a spectral absorption line profile of the lithium. And we use models to fit the profile. You see these dots are observations of the spectral line. And the full line are models that we are calculating from radiative transfer models of atmospheres to, to derive abundance of lithium in stars. And you can see that all this small difference here between the dots and full line is caused by the presence of this small isotope, lithium-6. And detecting this lithium-6 isotope, you need very high precision spectra, very good quality spectra to make this. So in this case, the signal-to-noise ratio is about 1,000. But you also need to have very good, careful models to be able to see this difference. Because if you find this difference, it has very strong implications for models, for theories, and so on and so on. So observationally, it's a very interesting work, very careful, very precise. But you are always close to models. You are always close to models. You use models of stellar atmospheres and radiation transfer to calculate line profiles and to fit them with observations and so on. And uh, how you can migrate planets close to the star or collide them even with the star, there are a few different cases. The first one, which is called planetary migration, is when you start from at five astronomical units like a Jupiter and you have a disk which has a gas and dust. It's an accretion disk with gas and dust. And the time scale of, of migration is about 10 to, 20, 10 to 20 million years. Now, if you have a disk with no gas, but lots of rocks, planetissimos, what we call them, then the, the migration time scale can be up to one gig year, one billion year. The age of the sun is five. Okay? Just remember that the sun is five, and it takes one giga year for a Jupiter-like planet to migrate and collide with a star if there is no gas in the disk, the whole gas is gone, okay? And then you have another process, which is multi-body interactions. Imagine that you have two Jupiters. You have two Jupiters, and in about 100 million years, you may have interaction between these two big planets, and one of them can be created by the star. So one of them will go to the star. It may take about 100 million years, depending on parameters. But then you have another uh, process, which is more complicated. It's called dynamical friction. Then you have lots of uh, rocks. And you have also a few planets in the system. 
And then in these systems, one of the planets is kicked away, kicked out from the system, and the other one goes directly to the star. And that again takes up to one giga year or more. So the solar system is quite exceptional. We cannot rule out that there were no big planets in the solar system in the past, when the system was 10, 20, 50 million years old. And finally, the last thing I want to mention you is the presence of radioactive nuclei in the Earth. Uh, thorium, uranium, and potassium. You know that uh, most of the geothermal energy in the Earth comes from the decay of radioactive nuclei. So they are responsible for geothermal energy. And, uh, and this nuclei come from interstellar dust, interstellar uh, cloud, protoplanetary cloud. If we go to other planetary systems, and this is an example, in these systems we are detecting the thorium, we are measuring the abundance of thorium, the amount of thorium in, this, in the star, which has a planetary system. And we found that there are 40% more thorium in this star compared with the sun, which means that the planets in this system also contain much more thorium, uranium, and potassium than the Earth, which means that the volcanic activity of the planets in this system is much, much higher. So all these measurements, we do it, we work with stars, but the implications are for planets. Okay, so that's a very important link because we cannot see planets. We don't know their chemical composition. We don't know the content, which is very important for formation of life, etc., etc. But looking at the star, we can tell what is happening with planets, how they were formed, what was the composition, and so on. And um, this is an example for osmium, another heavy element, which is clearly different in these two stars compared to the sun and this star with extrasolar planet. And finally, I want to talk about uh, an interesting spectral signature, which is called red age. Is the reflection of the sunlight from the chlorophyll, from, from the green, from uh, vegetation, okay? There were observations, spectral observations of the earth shine spectrum from satellites. So if we see the spectrum of the Earth, compare the spectrum of the Earth when this is covered by clouds or when it is dark and when it's open, basically when it's reflecting the sunlight from this, all this green area, we see a big difference in this part of the spectrum of the Earth, which is called a red age. So this difference in the spectral part, it's at 7,200 tungstrom, is caused by the reflection from chlorophyll, from the green. So which means that we can use this signature to study vegetation on extrasolar planets. Because we have lots of planets transiting their systems, and we see these planets reflecting their starlight. We see them. We can perfectly see it. We cannot get the spectra that, like we are doing for the Earth because of technology. We need big telescopes. We need etc etc but the method is exactly the same it's very simple so if any of these planets have vegetation and they have clouds and have stolen things we can use exactly this method to study the the biospheres if they have vegetation or not so this is already a very powerful tool for studying the biospheres of this planet and some of these planets are located in so-called habitable zone which is a function of the mass or the temperature of the star. This zone is called habitable zone, which means if the planet is placed here, the liquid water may exist on the surface. It's a function of the stellar mass or the temperature, because for cool stars, you have to be very close. For hot stars, you have to be far away. And that's what is reflected here. This is the distance. And the Earth and the Sun are here, right? This is the one solar mass, and this is the Earth. But if we go to cool stars, we can be 10 times closer to the sun, to the star, than the Earth. And we can still have a liquid water. It just, uh, this is very primitive and uh, naive thing, which is a lot of publicity around this thing. But it's and finally, there were, there was a, th this was the first case when we could clearly take a spectrum of a planet. Not the star, but the planet itself. 
with Spitzer and Hubble Space Telescopes. And we could see the carbon dioxide, we can see uh, a water and methane. For the first time, we clearly see the atmosphere of the planet in infrared. In infrared uh, and um, my last maybe comment is about future instruments like Espresso and HiRES. We are building for ESO, a VLT and ELT. The VLT is a very large telescope. Is, uh, there are four 8.2 meter telescopes in ESO Chile. And we are building a new spectrograph, which is called Espresso. It will be commissioned in next year, probably next end of the next year. And Espresso will combine a light from four telescopes, four eight-meter telescopes, and they use the combined light to detect planets with a precision 15, 20 centimeters per second. So we can see super Earths, but not the Earths yet, with a, at a distance of... Uh, so we cannot really look for solar analogs, solar system analogs. But with the next generation instrument like HiRES, which will be on ELT, the 38 meter new generation telescope, which ESO is building in the southern hemisphere, this spectrograph should be able to go to precisions less than 10 centimeter per second, when we can really see the Earth-like planets around sun-like stars. So this will happen in less than 10 years, probably, before 2020. And it's really the new generation of instruments that are coming on the way to Okay, right. So this was the uh, my my talk. Thank you very much. And I think it's better if you ask questions. Mm. Okay. Да, вы можете по-русски задавать вопросы, никаких проблем. Да. Есть гипотезы, но они каждый раз, когда наблюдается новая система, эти гипотезы исчезают. Вот поэтому это очень хорошая область астрономии. Там очень легко делать гипотезы, но каждый раз новые системы. Эти системы начинают разрушать все модели. Так что стандартного пока ничего нету. Торима. То, то есть планеты, которые нужно считать? Ну, считается, что звезда и планеты, они, они рождаются в той же облаке протопланетной. То есть все элементы в том же количестве, относительном количестве, что существует в звезде, должны существовать в планетах. Ну, в принципе, мы не знаем никаких процессов, которые могут уничтожить тяжелые ядра Торима. Нету такие. Такая нужна физика сотни миллионов градусов. Это же только ар-процесс сверхновых, который может создать такие тяжелые ядра. Никакой процесс в природе не может ничего делать с этими ядрами. Так что если там было 100 тысяч ядер Торима и урана в, этом, в этой облаке, так вот эти 100 тысяч, они так и останутся. Всегда. Ни, никакого процесса нет, что может быть. Я думаю, что сколько сложно месяц, а в звезде Да, таких процессов тоже не существует, которые могли бы вот, делать дифференциацию. Да? Вот, скажем, все они там, а другие здесь. В принципе, мы не знаем таких процессов. Поэтому мы всегда предполагаем, что относительное число ядер или атомов, вот этих тяжелых э, ядер, во всех планетах, во всяком случае, вот э, э, это роки, да, вот как, как Венера, Марс и так далее, должны быть одинаковые. Угу. Я Именно Юпитер, именно никаким это это компьютеры показывают 
это очень сложные вот эти симуляции, да, вот начинаешь э, с газа и, и пыли, и компьютер уже показывает то, что показывает через... Нет. Как, как, как можете повторять? Там, там в основном используется гидродинамика. Да, да, да. Радиационная гидродинамика или просто гидродинамика, да. да, да. Это вся классическая физика. Здесь никакой релятивистики, никаких квантовых празднеств, ничего такого нет. Это все простая физика. Просто, э, просто система очень сложная, очень много параметров. И даже если начинаете компьютерные вот симуляции, нужно все время держать под контролем, потому что они, когда выходят из-под контроля, <laughs> это единственная сложность. Да? Очень много нелинейных эффектов и так далее, стабилизация кода и так далее. В общем, но они очень сложные, все сложнее. Сейчас 2D или 3D начинают люди. Вот. Но самое главное, что сейчас очень много наблюдений. И эти модели уже не могут все, скажем, вот, объяснить. Всегда остаются вещи, которые они не могут. Да? Можно вопрос по поводу... Был слайд, то есть Mass Distribution Picture, да? Там? Да, вот это, да. Вот Юпитер, Сатурн, да. Это... Да, это... Наблюдательный или, или теоретический? Вот здесь, по-моему. Вот это и это. Это наблюдательная, а это теория. Да, вот понятно, что на наблюдателе вначале нет как бы, ну, околоземных масс. Да, да потому что наблюдений нет. Да. А чем, чем обусловлен вот этот провал э, середине между Юпитером и, ну, так сказать, Юпитером обратной планетой? Да, вот это тот же самый вопрос. Да? А Почему да? два пика, да, и внутри да, мы, мы не знаем. Не, не, нет. Вот видите, вот здесь тоже видно, да, модели тоже показывают, но почему вот это так? Нет, ну почему это не совсем научный вопрос, но все равно как бы зачастую философия некоторая проглядывается. Как бы еще, еще один вопрос. Вот вы сказали, допустим, мультипланетная система, да? Да. С разными, вот, допустим, рассмотрим мультипланетную систему с существенно разными периодами, которые, ну, планеты, да? да. Которые отличаются да. на порядок. Там, наверное, сложно как бы вычленять ну, влияние каждой планеты, поскольку период наблюдения у нас может быть недостаточно. Да, того, да. Чтобы... да. Да, 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 абсолютно. Так, ну еще да. один вопрос, такой немножко несерьезный. Вы с Брайаном Мэйем пытались, ну, точнее, исполняли песню 39-39? Не, не, не. Без него. Каким методом больше находятся планеты, которые, собственно, в свободном полете находятся, у которых три слова? Да, это... Да. Не-не-не. Их э, находят вообще-то в молодых скоплениях, как сигма и так далее, и прямые наблюдения. Прямые, то есть это direct imaging в инфракрасном. А по изохронам у них очень характеристический цвет, то есть они сильные красные. И когда вот делают очень глубокий имиджинг вот этих скоплений, очень глубокие, да, вот, до 25 величины или 26 величины, там начинают выясняться вот очень красные объекты. И нужно их отделять от фона, потому что есть и галактики, и все такое. И потом начинается работа с спектроскопией, с изохроном и так далее, чтобы понять, эти объекты принадлежат вот скоплению, на каком расстоянии они. Как только мы устанавливаем расстояние, сразу у нас получается и масса, и, и, и иллюминосити, и все такое. И уже понятно, что это, это планеты. Угу. Да, 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 да. Не, не, пока нет. Ну, ясно, что то, что здесь, то и там. Да. Да. 
всем вот есть конечные как бы, договоренности, потому что там, там может быть или нет. То есть как бы там я слышал много новостей или как бы конечно. Не, не, вы знаете, вообще это такая стратегия. Американцы делают очень много publicity, да, вот, без, без серьезных научных. Им это нужно, чтобы много фондов, много денег достать из нас и так далее. Да, поэтому они даже не ожидая, что другая группа может это отвергнуть, вот эти, они не ожидая даже этого, начинают пресс-релиз, начинают очень агрессивно атаковать прессу, делать, и выходит большой бум. И очень часто, очень часто, и так было несколько раз, они ошибаются. Потому что всегда другие группы, вот, например, вот группы швейцарцев, да, вот наши, они, у них более точные инструменты и более хорошие стратегии. И они всегда вот часто показывали, что вот эти планеты, которые они говорили там, их просто нет. Да, вот. Это такая область астрономии, там очень много конкуренции. Очень много. Но это хорошо. Хорошо, потому что обязательно без конкуренции ничего не получится. То есть не мертвая область, очень динамичная там. Это не планеты, это звезды, звезды. Это не планеты, это были звезды, да. Почему они не да, вот, скажем, вот такой пример. Вы мне показываете спектр звезда. Я даже могу, посмотрев на спектр, сразу сказать, вот это железо, это алюминий, это такой, читать спектр. Да, вот это. То есть я даже могу посмотреть на спектр и сравнивая спектр, я могу сказать, вот... Вот, это, вот эта звезда не, могу, не может существовать, это, это не, невозможно. Почему? Например, скажем, в галактике нет такой звезды, где вот количество, скажем, кислорода 200 раз больше, чем у Солнца. Такого просто не может существовать. Это нет. Или, скажем, нет такой звезды, где вот магний, серо, все или титаниум, у них нормальное содержание, а, а, а силитиум, да, силикум, 10 раз повышенное. Такого не может быть просто. Потому что есть процессы физические, которые четко контролируют содержание химических элементов в разных звездах. Они только разрешают в определенном степени вот разница может быть только вот так и только в этих звездах при этих температурах и так далее и так далее там там не хаос там все четко контролируется процессами нуклеосинтеза все эти элементы они раздаются сверхновых и в массивных звездах и в четком количестве и в течение эволюции они выбрасываются в межзвездное пространство там сформируются звезды второго поколения потом третьего поколения и все время Содержание вот этих элементов четко регулируется процессами э, формирования звезд. И мы это отлично знаем, понимаем и можем посчитать даже. То есть эти модели, они хорошо работают. Э, в смысле, мы, мы знаем, что возможно и что невозможно. И вот эти звезды, которые я показывал насчет лития, что там нету лития, вот это невозможно. Почему? Потому что нет таких физических процессов, которые могут так сильно подействовать на литий при этих температурах. Мы просто их не знаем. Не знаем. Вот если мы будем исследовать и найдем такие процессы, это другое дело. Но в данном случае сегодня мы просто не знаем никаких таких процессов. Может быть, даже не существует. Значит, это другие external, другие процессы, которые разрушили литий, или изначально литий там не было, по другим причинам. Но все-таки это все нестандартно будет. Очень нестандартное, очень интересное. Поэтому мы сейчас... Угу. Про корреляцию ну, концентрации лития и количество планет и вообще возраста системы, да, планетные или звезды. Вот, в общем, я так понял, что на последней экспериментальной корреляции было явно указано, что чем больше планет, тем меньше там, изотопов лития, правильно? 
не больше планет, а те, те звезды, у которых есть планеты, у них меньше лития. Да. То есть, да. А не противоречит ли это тем соображениям, что, скажем, при дальнейшей эволюции планетной системы, при миграции, ну, все, все, весь момент да. перейдет как бы обращать на энергию звезды? Да. И тем самым, скажем, поднимется, я вот не знаю, возможно, поднимется температура и выгорит ли. Не-не-не-не, нет, 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 это намного сложнее. Хорошо. Не, не, не. Это еще один вопрос. Сам спектр, ну, отраженный от планеты, от планеты. света, он анализируется каким-то образом? Мы нет, сигнал очень слабый, мы пока еще до этого не... Интегрированный свет, то есть интегрированный свет, да, можно. А спектр получить пока не можем. Спектр получить, это такой телескоп, нам нужен Хотя вообще а эти 40 лет. Можно утверждать, что это, допустим, ну, это в случае Земли это было сделано. Для Земли, да. Ну, Нет, потому что спутника, да. А да. вот, допустим, если у нас какая-нибудь тяжелая планета мы обнаружили, да. мы можем утверждать, что это планета, а не какой-нибудь белый карл, э, то есть коричневый карл, который э, вращается вместе с звездой. Ну, по массе. Коричневые карлики, у них у всех масса более чем 12 Юпитеров. А вот где вот 13 Юпитеров, это, это как раз вот где начинается синтез дейтерии. То есть а по определению коричневые карлики это объекты, где синтезируются дейтерии внутри. А планеты, там нет синтеза. Температура не доходит до миллиона градусов. Это, это физическое определение планеты и карликов и звезд. Звезды по определению, они сжигают э, водород. Э, желтые карлики и дитерии. Планеты ничего не сжигают. Это просто физическое определение. Раньше было другое определение планет, что они должны быть вращаться около звезд, там все такое. Потом мы подумали, что есть планеты, которые не вращают, так что это определение сейчас выходит. Я думаю, что самое правильное определение планеты это по физике а не по принадлежности к звездной системе и так далее. Поэтому, я считаю, вообще было очень глупо. И это глупо, когда вот Плутон сейчас уже не считается планетой. Я думаю, это просто было такой publicity, да, опять. Люди решили сделать немножко рекламы и взяли, включили Плутон в число вот этих э, объектов, которые за, за пределом Нептуна. Это глупость полная, да. Настоящее определение. Мы же электрон остается электроном. Неважно, это свободный электрон или около это не свободный, правильно, все-таки это электрон. То же самое должно быть с планетой. Это free floating планет или планета. Потому что мы знаем, что нормальные планеты, их можно вытолкнуть из системы на начальных фазах формирования. Минимальный размер. Нет, в данном случае в Солнечной системе это было вот э, по, всегда считалось, что вот Плутон это планета. Надо было оставить в покое, в покое Солнечную систему и все. Если уже речь идет о других системах, минимальная масса мы никогда не определяли. Минимальная масса никогда. И сейчас тоже нету такого определения, это планета или не планета. Форму можно, в принципе, учитывать. Она уже сферическая, да, из-за сфер гравитации. Да. Да не важно, как называть, важно понять вообще, как все это делается, физику, как формирует эволюция, все это важно. А как, как только начинается за именами гоняться, все сразу начинается. Допустим, какой-нибудь критерий того, что вот, э, есть биологический организм на планете, есть ли такой критерий для спектра звезды? То есть вот мы увидели спектр звезды, и мы вот скажем, что вот около этой, у планеты около этой звезды точно нет биологической активности, чтобы живое, да, вот. Ну, Нет. Даже, ну, воды там, да, 
Для биосферы, говорят, вот минимальные требования для биосферы, это вот кислород, метан, это все вот эти принципиальные молекулы, да? Ну, плюс еще вот этот Red H, что я показал, если это есть, то все это вместе уже, что там биосфера. Но если там живое что-то, это намного сложнее. Да. Но есть такие критерии, для, именно накладываемые на спектр звезды? Нет. 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 Это только по спектру планет можно. А на спектр звезды нет. У вас был слайд со статистикой открытых планет. Там было написано, что открыто 8 планет с молекулами. Да. Да. Атмосфера планет. То есть мы, вот как вот этот случай, я вам показал, вот последний, да, вот, видите, здесь. Вот это. Вот видите, вот это прямые наблюдения, спектральные наблюдения планеты. То есть как мы наблюдаем звезды через спектры, так и прямо наблюдаем вот эту планету с помощью Спицера и так далее, в инфракрасном. И э, это газовая планета, гигантская планета, и там вот э, молекулярные линии и так далее. Но есть и сто случаев, вот таких, когда вот планета, когда вот транзит проходит через диск э, звезды, часть звездного излучения проходит через планетную атмосферу. И мы можем сравнить спектр звезды до и после прохождения. И разница нам дает молекулярные линии, которые образуются в спектре звезды, когда она проходит через планетную атмосферу. Это опять-таки нужно очень там, тонко, вот, э, очень большой сигнал шум, очень такие серьезные наблюдения. И были такие наблюдения, несколько таких случаев есть, что мы наблюдаем линии. Да. Что? Да, естественно. Чем больше, чем... Да, да, конечно. Да. Что? Для какой? А, да, это прямые, прямые, прямые наблюдения, да, да, да. да. Это как наблюдать звезду, вот так и эту планету, в инфракрасном, да? Угу. Но чем больше будет телескопов, чем больше зеркала, тем больше вот и, и таких спектров мы еще сотни будем видеть через ближайшие вот. Нам просто нужны большие телескопы, да, вот. И Джеймс Уэбб, вот американский, вот шесть, как раз вот будет заниматься такими -то вещами тоже. Да. А вот такой вопрос общего плана. Чем обычно ну, обуславливается такое даже четкое разделение при эволюции планетной системы на газовые планеты и на планеты земляного типа? То есть мы с анигулярным теорией даже рассматриваем. Да, да. Ну, считается, что на определенном расстоянии, чтобы получить... Э, там э, у нас есть две конкурирующие модели формирования планеты. Одна модель называется Core Christian. Это значит, нужно сформировать ядро сначала, большое ядро, минимум 10 раз больше, чем масса Земли. А потом вот это ядро будет с помощью аккреции э, взять газ. И получается гигантская планета, как Юпитер. То есть в центре тяжелое ядро э, а, и, и, и большое, вот большая газовая оболочка, атмосфера. Но если вот масса ядра недостаточно, то она не может через аккрецию собирать э, э, материал. Дело в том, что если мы ближе к звезде, вот как Венера и так далее, да, там родятся звезды, она э, все вот весь газ э, через э, вот radiation pressure, да, э, радиационные, ой, я не Давление, да. Она весь газ оставляет только в периферии системы, где будут формироваться гигантские планеты, а также может быть даже Нептун или другие планеты, у которых маленькое ядро, но все-таки там есть газ. И газ может образоваться около вот этих планет. 
А те, которые ближе к звезде, как Венера и так далее, там, в принципе, газовой оболочки нет. С другой стороны, ведь планеты земного типа тоже не могут быть а, быстро вращающимися, потому что их просто разорвет гравитационной силой. А газовый... А вы имеете в виду вот такое вращение, да, вокруг своей оси? Э -э Почему такое вращение должно взорвать планету? Ну, это в любом случае не... Ну, такая ситуация получается, что и как бы сверхбыстрые планеты должны быть по идее газовыми, да, и такие вот, как Юпитер. Не, это, по-моему, это с вращением планеты не связано с вращением планеты вокруг своей оси, потому что вращение планеты – это история, это все-таки история всех этих ударов. Почему планета вращается? Это от ударов. Никто не знает, как будет вращаться какая-то планета до, до того, как закончена вот эта фаза, когда все камни или бентиориты, они все… Первая фаза формирования планеты – это фаза каннибализма. Там удары, война… Все такое, кто что получит, да, и что останется потом, после всего этого. Так что я думаю, что вот эти попытки, чтобы посчитать, как вращается вот эта планета, почему вращается вот так, с такой скоростью, это не имеет смысла, потому что это вся очень такая история хаоса, это история хаоса, в принципе. Это сотни тысяч, десятки тысяч ударов в разных направлениях. Да, 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 да. Вот, в общем, вы сказали, ну, там, насчет второго метра не особо много слов говорилось, насчет транзит, нет, насчет третьего, да, транзитный, который. Да, вот, да. Вы сказали, что ну, как бы вы рассмотрели два идеальных случая. Первый это когда мы можем отлично наблюдать, то есть когда у нас плоскость энергетически как бы нам благоволит, то мы можем спокойно посчитать да, изменение яркости, скажем. А второй случай это партикулярно. Когда мы, мы не сможем изменение яркости от звезды посмотреть, да? А что будет в промежуточных случаях? То есть, когда у нас mm -hmm. по, 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 ну, скажем, да. планета едва перекрывает... Э... Диск, да? Да, да. 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 Ну, да, да, не может. Практически невозможно. Если планета перекрывает только верхнюю часть диска и проходит быстро, то, в принципе, а, невозможно. То есть, да, конечно, да. Если это чем быстро, мы вообще даже не узнаем об этом. Спасибо.